This is Money Motivation and Mike, and I am your host, Michael Wainwright. In charge of all the controls is audio engineer, Jason Wright. And hello to you world. This is the show that will change your life. You can contact us at info at mx3.vip, and you can find all of our content at mx3.vip, or go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at mx 3 podcasts. And don't forget to hit the like, subscribe icon bells to get notified of all of our new content, which comes out every Monday morning around nine o'clock. And hello to you world. This is a great day to be alive, a wonderful day. And let's get right to our, to our listening audience and our viewing audience, Jason. And our viewing audience is coming on at a monumental clip in my eyes. Our subscribers over the last seven days with our YouTube channel is up 64% from the previous seven days. Our subscribers on YouTube have listened 43% more in the last seven days than in the previous seven days. And our overall count for the last 28 days on YouTube, we're up 156 subscribers, which is basically most of September over August. And we're up 138 more percent of watch time. Over the last 28 days, which, like I say, September versus August, and our and our and our podcast numbers, and I know we've been really focusing on getting our YouTube channel out there, but we're still in the high 20,000s, uh, 29,680 listeners over the last 30 days on our on our podcast channel. All of that great stuff. Once again, always continuing to thank you, the listening audience. You continues to show us that the content that we put out is something you want to hear. And what I have heard, Jason, through some uh, commentary through our emails and just knowing people and, and talking to folks is we discussed two episodes of the Dallas Cowboys. You know, they are America's team. You've heard about this, right? I've heard of them. Yes. And um, over America's team. And then we went last week to, to Trump mm-hmm. and, 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 and that stuff. And now we've got to get back to our Dallas Cowboys since we're right here coming into week four of the NFL season. And we're moving into the 1970s with the Dallas Cowboys, and it's a decade that's very, very important to me because it is the reason I still watch the Dallas Cowboys to this day. Obviously, Roger Staubach being one of my all-time heroes uh, since my youth days and, and, and to this particular day. Now, these 1970s, even though people don't know, People who, who, who don't keep up with it uh, don't know that Roger Staubach in the 1970s, even though he joined the Cowboys in 1969, he did not become the full-time starter until 1971. So this team that went in 1970 and played in their first Super Bowl, Super Bowl V, which is a monumental Super Bowl, which we'll get into here momentarily, Roger did not get the job till mid-1971 season and then rode on from, from there. And we'll get into that momentarily. Nevertheless... Jason, did you know in the year, the decade of the 1970s, 1970 to 1979, the Cowboys went to the playoffs nine of those 10 years, only missing in 1974. It was the only year they did not make the playoffs. I did not know that. Yes. They won the division, the NFC East, seven of those 10 years, uh, only missing in 74, 75 and 72, 72, I forgot about 72. But good year about 75 as they went to the Super Bowl. So they turned that, 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 um, uh, that, that wild card. They didn't win the division in 75, but they said so win as a wild card and turned that into a Super Bowl appearance, which we'll talk about momentarily. And, of course, they won the NFC uh, Conference, which is the old NFL, five times, 70, 71, 75, 77, and 78. So... When you were growing up in that in, in that decade, like I was, you are you become to get in, get to know what the Super Bowl is all about, and you expect the Dallas Cowboys to go to the Super Bowl every year. Right. And and actually, in 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 my time, I expect them to play the Pittsburgh Steelers every year, because the first year I remember watching Dallas Cowboys was nineteen seventy five. They played the Steelers in seventy five. They played the Steelers in seventy eight. Uh, so. We lose both of those games, and that's why Super Bowl Thirty in 1995 was important to me because we finally beat the Pittsburgh Steelers. But nevertheless, back on uh, the 1970 season, which ends up being Super Bowl Five, 
Now, why is Super Bowl V a big deal? Because it is the first year that the Super Bowl was called Super Bowl. Super Bowl one through Super Bowls one through four were called the NFL AFL Championship. They went back and renumbered them, starting with that Super Bowl with NFL AFL Championship number one, and called it Super Bowl one. So we roll in here in 1970, and it's called the Super Bowl, which is ended up being Super Bowl five. The Cowboys making their first appearance are playing the Baltimore Coats, who two years before represented the NFL in the NFL AFL championship. Now, Super Bowl V, 1970s, the first year that we went to uh, AFC and NFC. And when the merger happened in 1970, the Colts went to the AFC. So in the first five years of Super Bowl, in a two-year, in, th- in two of the three-year span there, the Colts represented both conferences in the Super Bowl. Hmm. And in this particular case, they end up beating the Cowboys 16-13 to 13 in Super Bowl V which continued the Dallas Cowboys uh, being known as the Bridesmaids and next year's champion. Now, in that game, Jason, there's a couple of uh, tidbits that you should know about. Craig Morton, he was our quarterback at that time, had been the quarterback and taken over for Don Meredith. And Craig Morton come on, he threw three interceptions in that game. They were all in the fourth quarter. Um, we had a 13-7 to lead in the third quarter, going in for a touchdown. And we fumbled inside the two yard line. Would have made it twenty to seven. Remember, the final score was sixteen to thirteen. We fumble going in. We're about to go up thirteen points. Big, big turn of events in that game. Now, also in that game, here's another monumental thing: is Chuck Howley was the MVP of that Super Bowl. He played for the Dallas Cowboys, losing team, had three interceptions. Never in the history of the Super Bowl has the MVP went to a losing player. Mm -hmm. Chuck Howley, the only player in NFL history, Super Bowl, to be the MVP. There was also a controversial play in that game. Back in those days, an offensive player could not touch the ball and the ball be received by another offensive player. And there was a pass downfield that appeared to be tipped by a Baltimore coat and then tipped into the hands of his teammate. Huge play, 30, 40 yards at least. I'm not really familiar. I don't really know the number, but it was a long play, big play in the game. And the Cowboys argued, I can still see Charlie Waters watching the replays, uh, jumping up and down because that play should have been illegal. And that was a big play in the game that obviously gave the Coats points. And and it was, it was late in the game, and I don't know if it was on – uh, the drive that took them down to kick the field goal to beat the Cowboys because it was 13 to 13. Uh, and the coach kicked that late, that late field goal by Jim O'Brien with five seconds left to beat the Cowboys. And there's also a big view of the legendary uh, Bob Lilly throwing his helmet about 40 yards. Thank God it didn't hit anybody because <laughs> when you watch it, you go, Oh my gosh. And you see the, and you see this helmet flying on, on uh, you go back and watch that game you, you just, who's it going to hit? Oh. And fortunately, it didn't hit anybody. So there you go, 1970, big year for the Cowboys. Still didn't break through. Um, here's your little tidbit going into 1971. Now, this is very, very interesting. Craig Morton still starts the season as the quarterback. Roger, remember, Roger's a Hall of Famer, a Hall of Famer but at this time, Heisman Trophy winner. He's now on the team for his third year. You know, back in those days, those those legendary coaches like the Tom Landrys of the world and, mm-hmm. and, and Don Shula, who coached the Dolphins that were fixing to beat here in 1971, uh, and then on to Chuck Knoll, who ran the Pittsburgh Steelers th- throughout the 1970s, they didn't believe in sticking rookies out there on the field, especially not rookie quarterbacks. That's why three years into his career, Roger Staubach's just now starting to get playing time. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. All right, so here we go. Roger needs to be on the field. It's been Craig Morton's team since Don Meredith retired. Uh, And I got two quarterbacks. So what does Tom Landry do? He rotates quarterbacks every other play. The (laughs) quarterbacks are running in and out. Wow. How about that? Now, back in those days, and even even during um, uh, my times in the 80s of playing high school football or, or, or junior high on, the receivers ran the plays in. You, yeah. weren't, you weren't making signals from the, from the sidelines, you know, and, and doing this run and gun deal. Yeah. 
Receivers are running in plays. You're rotating out at receiver, bringing in the play. You give the quarterback. He calls it out. You go. Tom Landry's over here giving the giving the play to his quarterback. And his quarterbacks are running off and on the field. And they're not high-fiving as they go by each other. <laughs> <laughs> they're not very pumped about it. Not very pumped about it at all. Nevertheless, um, I guess that's when Landry decided that Stallback was a better quarterback than Craig Morton that we will get to in 1977, later on down the road. Uh, but in, anyway, nevertheless, Stallback takes over about midseason, becomes the full-time quarterback, takes the Cowboys uh, uh, to the Super Bowl, beats the Miami Dolphins, coached by Don Shula, 24-3. to Here is another interesting tidbit. That game was played in New Orleans at the Ode to Lane Stadium. Because, you know, we have a lot of Super Bowls now. Mm-hmm. What, every three, four, five years, it's played in New Orleans at the Superdome. Right. Dallas Cowboys end up winning 1977 Super Bowl at the Superdome. Okay. But in 1971, they played at Ode to Lane Stadium. Now, you think about in today's uh, glitz and glory of the Super Bowl and, and them showing up uh, up at, up at OU or, or, or down at Texas or Texas A&M, you know, or, or going out to Alabama and playing a Super Bowl. What's the attendance like in that? Like- uh, Thirty, forty thousand, 40,000 or something? You know what? That's going to be a, that's going to be a, maybe you ought to look that up here while I'm continuing on talking about these glory days. But nevertheless, yes, played the Super Bowl in 1971 at Old Tulane Stadium. And by the way, Tulane, the Tulane Green Wave also plays at Super, Superdome now as well. Uh, 73, back in the NFC Championship game, got beat, I believe, by the Redskins. That's right, because the Redskins end up playing the Dolphins in what end up being the Dolphins' perfect season in 1973 and still stands to this day not the only perfect regular season but the perfect season because you remember the 2007 uh, uh, New England Patriots end up going uh, 16 and 0 uh, 74 missed the playoffs and then here comes 1975 which Dallas does not win the division they come in as a wild card they are the first ever team Jason to, to make the Super Bowl as a wild card team uh, from from um, 1975 uh, go all the way. They they ended up uh, going out and uh, they beat, beat the Rams to go to the Super Bowl. Had the Steelers down ten to nine, going into the fourth quarter of that Super Bowl. You know, I talked about here a couple episodes ago how close it was to being called the Tom Landry Trophy instead of the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Let's think about how close the Dallas Cowboys were to being the team of the seventies and not the Pittsburgh Steelers. We ended up losing this game twenty to seventeen. Had a punt blocked late. Um, it ended up being a safety, uh, but they ended up back with the ball. And, you know, those are those uh, heroic Harry Houdini catches that I like to say on Lynn Swan. And you also think about this. Lynn Swan ended up being the MVP of what ended up being Super Bowl Ten. He had four catches. Four catches don't even get you mentioned in the, mm-hmm. in the paper anymore when, when you're in the Super Bowl. He had four catches. Now, I know there were big catches. He had four catches. He was the MVP of, of, of Super Bowl 10, the 1975 uh, season. Hey, and another interesting thing about that game, and that game was played at the Orange Bowl, the Orange Bowl that had AstroTurf, by the way. All we know the Orange Bowl as is having natural grass. Uh, as you watch the Orange Bowl in the late 70s and on until they go over to Joe Robbie, uh, that stadium was, was grass. But this 1975 Super Bowl was turf. And in that game, there, there's an old movie. And if you haven't seen this movie, you know, we talk about movies on here. Mm-hmm. And we got, we got episodes to do on movies coming up in the near future. But there was a show called Black Sunday where uh, the blimp, the Goodyear blimp, mm-hmm. lands in the stadium. Okay. And it, it lands in the stadium of Super Bowl Ten. You need to go watch that movie. I will. Okay. So the, 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 the footage in this movie is really the Cowboys and Steelers in Super Bowl X. It's, it's a very, very interesting movie. I can't remember exactly who stars in it, but I remember watching it and, and actually thinking that it was, it was really happening. <laughs> and uh, obviously we were, we, we were hoping that the results would turn out differently, but the Steelers still won the game. Mm. One tidbit on 1970 that I did not mention. In the opening round of 1970, the Detroit Lions come to the Cotton Bowl. Cowboys still play at the Cotton Bowl. And um, the Cowboys beat them five to nothing on a safety and a field goal. 
Wow. That's how Dallas won the divisional round of the 1970 playoffs. Still to this day is the lowest scoring game in NFL playoff history. So lots of lots of things happening there in those early 70s. Now, also, a, a big rivalry of the Dallas Cowboys is erupting here in the 70-71 uh, uh, gathering is because the Cowboys end up beating the San Francisco 49ers in 70 and 71, back-to-back years. Beat them, beat them both times uh, in, those, in those playoffs uh, to go to those Super Bowls. And one of those here, – here's another stadium. I talked about Tulane. The San Francisco 49ers back in those days – played at a, 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 a stadium called Keysar Stadium in downtown San Francisco. Keysar Stadium. Keysar. Go, go, yeah, go find out how many people attended uh, that NFC championship game back in those days. Hey, 75? Yes, sir. Tulane was 35,000 capacity. 35,000. Yeah. Now, the official capacity today is 30,000. So maybe they brought in a few extra seats. Yeah, they, they definitely had some uh, flip chairs down there on the grass. <laughs> That's right. Definitely, definitely did that. Okay, moving right along and moving into 1976. By the way, the first time I got to go to an NFL football game was in 1975. Uh, And then in 1976 was the first time that I got to go to a playoff game, which was against the Rams, the Los Angeles Rams at that time. And they came to town and beat our Cowboys 14 to 12. And I remember late in that game trying to get down the field uh, and we got uh, on a fourth down play. We got uh, caught just a, a yard or two short, uh, trying to get in position to be able to kick a field goal to win that game. Uh, it was a pass to Billy Joel Dupree, and he he didn't make the yardage. And we um, we 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 bow out in the first round of the 1976 season, even though um, we did win the division that year. As a matter of fact, here in Roger Staubach's last four years of his playing. 76, 77, 78, and 79, the Cowboys won the division and um, went to the Super Bowl twice, winning one of those. And here we come into 77, the team that I remember the most, uh, my favorite team of all time, Dallas Cowboys. And, and that team went 12-2, and two, um, Jason, 12-2, and two, and uh, beat Walter Payton and in the, in the Chicago Bears in the first round of the playoffs, dominated him. And, and, and remember, we had Tony Dorsett, but Payton was the stud. Peyton, Earl Campbell, Tony Dorsett, but Sweetness is, was his nickname. And, and he was the dude, and the doomsday defense shut him down. Go into the NFC Championship against the Minnesota Vikings. Minnesota Vikings were a big team in the 1970s as well. And beat the Vikings and Fran Tarkin to go on to Super Bowl twelve, held in New Orleans at the indoor Superdome. And what was... Interesting about that team is they played the Denver Broncos. The Denver Broncos were being quarterbacked by none other than Craig Morton. Craig Morton that had been the Cowboy quarterback and taken the Cowboys to their first ever Super Bowl back in 1970 and then being replaced by Stahlbeck midseason. So very, very monumental uh, game as well. And what else is important there is 1977 was co-MVPs of a Super Bowl. The only time still that we've had co-MVPs of a Super Bowl, which was um, Randy White and Harvey Martin. Martinized. That's what they used to call Harvey Martin. When, you, when, when Harvey would sack a quarterback. Now, remember, this is back before they kept sack totals. And they went back, and, and Harvey Martin had uh, well over 100 sacks and would be considered an all-time great if we kept stats like we do today. But when Harvey Martin would sack someone, you just got Martinized, okay? (laughs) And then Randy White, they considered him to be half man, half monster, the manster. There were were their two. He he was named the manster, half man, half half monster. Gotcha. So both of those guys, they were the co-MVPs. Now, I want you to think about that as well. Here we are. um, We are... We we, in, In just the first 12 Super Bowls, we've already had three... In defensive MVPs, three defensive MVPs. Larry Brown comes along in Super Bowl 30 because, as you remember, Neil O'Donnell decided to keep throwing it to him, and he was the MVP of that Super Bowl. And frankly, in Super Bowl 28, uh, Emmett Smith, and I have no problem with Emmett Smith having the, having the MVP of that Super Bowl, but the Super Bowl MVP of that team was James Washington. 
He's the one that turned the game, stripped the ball, got picked up, ran back for a touchdown, interception. Uh, uh, matter of fact, James Washington's the ones that ran it back for a touchdown. Uh, Leon Lip caused that fumble. But nevertheless, there's another guy that really turned that game and continued to be a big part of that game on the defensive end that should have won the MVP. But as we know, most of the time, it always goes to the offensive player. And that also tells you how bad – the offenses were in Super Bowl five to give the trophy, the MVP trophy, to a defensive player on a losing team. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Johnny Unitas did not get to play in that game, even though he was a Baltimore coat. Um, he was on the losing end of the Super Bowl three when the coats were representing the NFC. So here we are, 77, big time stuff once again. Uh, my, my favorite team of all time, you know, and it was doomsday dominance, no doubt about it. Uh, and, and I didn't mention in Super Bowl that in, in, in Super Bowl six against the Dolphins and where I mentioned that Craig Morton and Stallback were, were trading out back and forth and rotating in plays and Stallback takes over and he ends up becoming uh, the MVP of Super Bowl six. So Stallback has that to his, his uh, belt as well. So now we come to Super Bowl we come to the 1978 Super Bowl. Once again, big time things. What was so big deal about 1978 is when the NFL went from a 14 to a 16 game schedule. So now you got two more games. Went to 16 games. Super Bowl 13 was the first year to host two two teams that had played a 16 game schedule, obviously. And here we are going back up against uh, none other than our uh, buddies, the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is the first time there was a rematch in the Super Bowl, which is Super Bowl 13. Now, you think about that. Dallas plays Pittsburgh in Super Bowl 10. They play the the Broncos in Super Bowl 12, and now they're back to Pittsburgh in Super Bowl 13. Now, obviously, there have been other teams play each other twice in a Super Bowl now, but remember, in Super Bowl 30, the Cowboys and Steelers played again, so they played each other three times. And wouldn't we all like to see one more of, of those games? Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, 1978, big game, uh, big deal. There's a couple of moments in that game. And, I, I, you know, and, and for, the, for the listening and viewing audience, uh, as, as you can see, I do have notes in front of me, but I hardly ever look at them because I can just remember these days uh, like they were, they were yesterday. And the, things I, the, 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 the tidbits I point out are not stuff that I've went and read about. It's stuff that I remember. And I went back and, and, and researched and made sure that my memory was correct. But in this 1978 um, Super Bowl, there were two big plays. Uh, Pittsburgh had gotten out on us, but we had battled back. And we were right in the thick of it. There were two big plays. One of them, Pittsburgh had just scored to take the lead. And Randy White, the, the co-MVP of Super Bowl twelve, Randy White had broke his hand, bro- broke his hand there late in the season. And had a cast on his hand. So played defense. He was also on the kickoff return team. Pittsburgh Steelers wisely saw that. And on the kickoff, they kicked the ball to Randy White. <laughs> Randy White picks it up, sticks it into his hand, with, with, with uh, his, his, his arm and hand that was wrapped up because of the broken wrist. And, of course, the first contact that's made, here comes the fumble. Mm. Steelers recover. And quickly score another touchdown, um, uh, as as they often did. They were big time strikers. A lot of MVP, a lot, lot of Hall of Famers on that team. That was a big play. Now, even with that, where it was uh, late in that game, uh, Dallas Cowboys had another chance to, or had a chance to tie that game up. And that's the old uh, Jackie Smith play, where Stallback threw it into the end zone. Jackie Smith's wide open. Nobody's covering him. Hits him right in the bread basket, and he dropped the ball. Oh, yes. And of course, in Roger Stallback, um, and in a Roger Stallback way, Roger said he just threw it too soft. I should have put some more mustard on it, and just buried it in his gut. And uh, and I can still remember um, Vern Link was saying on the radio that Jackie Smith must be the sickest man in the world. Now. Jackie had been brought over in midseason. He's a longtime St. Louis Cardinal who were always who were also in our division the same Cardinals that just beat us last week. Uh, but nevertheless, Jackie Smith was brought over in midseason as a pickup uh, for the tight end position. We already had some good tight ends, but Dallas was stacked, and but so was Pittsburgh. And so Jackie Smith only plays that 78 season, 
And, of course, he would love to forget the Dallas Cowboys due to the Super Bowl thirteen drop. I don't know that he ever even played in just maybe a couple. I mean, the, the Cardinals weren't bad in the 70s. I think they went to a – I think they won the 75 division. But he would have played in a, in a, in a game or two. Never played in a, in a championship game. Never played in a Super Bowl. So I don't know if that was part of uh, the drop or whatever because, you know, that pressure gets tight the bigger the stage. Uh, but nevertheless, Jackie Smith never once again in the history of the rest of his life talked about the Dallas Cowboys. And he was a Hall of Fame Hall of Fame tight end. And when he was put into the Hall of Fame, and during his speech, he never mentioned the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Moving on to the end of the decade. Um, 1979, Cowboys win the division again. Uh, playing fantastic. Stallback having another great a great career. I do remember how we won the division in 1979 because I was watching this this game as well. We're down 17 to nothing. Remember, we we covered those Washington Redskins a little bit, and we're down 17 to nothing at halftime, and come back and win that game 35-34 uh, on Captain Comeback scoring two touchdowns there late in late in the game, uh, two three minutes to go in the game, hitting Tony Hill over in the right corner of an end zone. Um, uh, Larry Cole making a big play late. I can remember um, stopping John Riggins, who ends up being the MVP a couple of years later in the Super Bowl. Uh, but a big game. We win that division title. Knock the, knock, we're already in the playoffs, but we end up winning that last game of the year, beating the Redskins, knocking them out of the playoffs. And then we have the little low, helpless Los Angeles Rams coming to town with uh, Vince Ferragamo as their quarterback. And they roll in here and beat us again because I told you that in uh, uh, 1976 they rolled in here and beat us. We beat them in 75 and 78 to go to the Super Bowls. Cowboys played the Rams a lot back then um, in, the, in the playoffs as well as, as the, as the uh, Vikings. But nevertheless, they end up beating us in the first round of the playoffs. Now here is a big, huge trivia question because that was Roger Staubach's last ever game, losing to the Los Angeles Rams in the 1979 playoffs. And here is a, a, a big trivia question, and that is, who was Roger Staubach's last ever pass completed to? Well, most people aren't going to know this, and I can tell by the look on your face, Jason, you don't know it either. His last pass was completed to an offensive lineman. No way. Named Tom Rafferty. How does that happen? Uh, it's one of them deals where he throws a pass, it gets deflected by the line, pops up in the air, the center catches it, takes off running. And that was the last pass that Roger Staubach ever wow. threw in the National Football League. So you think about this. The center hocked him the ball. Mm -hmm. He rows back, throws it. It gets deflected and lands back with the center. So the center started the play and the center ended the play. <laughs> well, the fact that I played center, I was kind of happy about that. That's fantastic. Yes. Uh, but nevertheless, those two games, I gave you tidbits on Super Bowl ten, Super, Super Bowl thirteen of how, I wouldn't say easily, but it was a simple way for the Cowboys to have won both of those games. Uh, they faltered. They didn't have it there to be able to do it. And nothing, nothing against the Steelers. The Steelers were really, really good, and their numbers show that. But here we are, like I talked about in the 60s, with uh, the development of, of, of the, the Redskin rivalry coming about before the Cowboys even had a franchise, and then playing those Packer teams there at the end. And then coming into the 70s, and, and being involved with what ends up being the early years of the 49er Cowboy rivalry that continues to this day, playing Cowboys 49ers, playing the playoffs the last two years. Everybody remembers the catch in 1981, which we'll talk about in a future episode covering the decade of the 80s, which will not take long. Wasn't a whole lot going on in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> take it to the 90s. Yes, yeah, yeah, but that, that's exactly right. But nevertheless, the Cowboys uh, ramp up a rivalry with the 49ers, that let's th let me think here for a minute uh 70s 80s 90s um and then the 2020s so there's four decades of cowboy 49er playoff football uh, there was a stretch there as a matter of fact there in there in the um um 2000s early 2000s cowboys and 49ers two of the worst teams in the league they're in those 5 and 11 days of 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 uh, Dave Campo. Dave Campo. You don't even know who that is, do you? No, I do not. Yeah. Uh, there's your trivia question. Who is Dave Campo? 
Most Dallas Cowboy fans couldn't tell you, but he coached the Cowboys for three years. Oh, no. He went five and 11, three years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's right. Um, very, the, the, if you took away one of the Super Bowls in the 1990s, the most successful Dallas Cowboy era was the 1970s. And, you know, the Cowboys won 20 games in a row, which I mentioned uh, a couple episodes back. And this 1970s, even in 74 when they didn't make the playoffs, still had a winning record. And the 1970s was in the middle of that 20-year run of winning football, winning football that still continues to this day. No one's ever won 20, 20 seasons in a row of, of, of a winning record. So that 1970s, now you're always going to have to go give it to the 90s because they, they won three Super Bowls. They won a ton of games. Uh, as I say, it, we, you know, we, didn't, we, we were not playing 16 games uh, until um, 1978. So they, only, they put a 14-game schedule eight of those 10 years. Still won 100 games uh, in that 10-year stretch and, and made all those uh, playoff appearances and Super Bowls and, and, and all that good stuff. So the 1970s will always be dear to my heart. Uh, they, they helped me to, through some good times. And their, their good times turned into great times and on and on and on. And I feel very fortunate and very privileged to be able to have experienced some of that stuff live as well as getting to watch it every week because it was, you know, we didn't have the coverage that we do today. So when they came on, when they came on, they, matter of fact, the whole NFL, when, if you got to go to an NFL game or you just sitting there watching live at noon or three on Sunday, because remember that's when the game started back then. And, and they, you had overlaps, but now it's all about the money. And, you know, we got to have a 325 start so we can get that game over with before mm-hmm. this game starts, you know, and they got Sunday night football, you know, all the things that we know. Yep. But nevertheless, when they came on Sunday, you didn't know anything that happened from the previous week. I mean, it's not like that you were able to get a paper and read about what was going on out there at practice every day. Now you get to know about what's going on at practice three or four times a day just from the TV, and then your, your, yeah. your, your radio stations are covering it uh, every minute of the day. Right. So everything that you've heard for the last six days, now we're going to see if they can show up on Sunday and do it. Well, when they came on on Sunday, they were, they were superstars, movie stars, rock stars. They were legendary in little boys' minds like myself. They were legendary in, in adults' minds mm-hmm. because – they were bigger than life. They were larger than life. Um, Money Motivation and Mike always continues to bring you content, and I know that by our viewing audience and our listening audience, uh, the Dallas Cowboys have, are, are a subject that people like to hear about, and I know I like to talk about it. In these 1970s that we just talked about, that's what put the Cowboys on the map as America's team that still grows to this day, and, and, and the audience and the, and the fan base continue to show that. But we will continue our, our process of this and covering some other football things. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot of topics to, to, to uh, go over, uh, a, a lot of things that we want to continue to do. Um, we'll see what goes on in the political world this week. Uh, I've got some, uh, some things on some estate planning that needs to be talked about. We have movie section that we have not even gotten into that may not be getting into the first of the year, Jason. We've got a lot of content. And once again, you can find it all at mx3.vip or you can contact us at info at mx3.vip. And we want to hear from all your questions, comments, and, and anything that you might want to talk about. And of course, go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at mx3 podcast, where that, that, that show continues to grow on a daily basis. And we're very, very proud of that as the numbers continue to rise. So once again, for Jason, myself, the Dallas Cowboys of the 1970s continue to live your life the right way.